Welcome to Pharma Docs with your hosts, myself, Dr. Jay Resnick, and Dr. John Robertson. Practicing oral surgeons bring you the latest and greatest in pharmacology as it affects you in your daily dental practice. Good evening, John. How are you? Good evening, Jay. Good to How- see you. Great to see you yeah. as well. I, I hope uh, everything has been going well since two weeks ago. Yeah. I last saw you on our yeah. last great episode. Um, yep, no complaints. H- yeah. How's there? How's everything out there? Good. And it's uh, we've had decent weather. We had a little hot streak. We had a cold streak. Um, today's a little cooler. It's supposed to be warmer next week. Uh, typical spring weather here. Awesome. Yeah. We are experiencing the same thing right now. It's wonderful. It just feels so great outside. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that the heat and humidity are on their way here in a couple oh, yeah. of months. All right. Yeah. It you got will... that winning combination out there. Oh uh, yeah. Guaranteed. Um, yeah. It, it can just be brutal for you. Yeah. You yeah. know, Jay, um, it, it's amazing. Uh, we, we, we tell everybody over and over about the number of drugs coming out. Yeah. I mean, you, you can almost take it to the bank, Jay. Yeah. I mean, we've been doing In between this- our shows. We're going to have four or five new drugs yeah. every time. Yeah. Yeah. We've been having like four or five for every episode. And that's, we've started with, this is number, this episode, I think 13. Yes. And um, so we've been doing this for, for months. And in that short period of time, uh, probably with 60, 70 new drugs have come out. Yes. Yeah. It's, with, it's with, with that, with that, and, and how do you keep up with it, Jay? It's hard. It's hard. It, I mean, it's hard enough for, for you, you and uh, me to do it. Um, Cause you know, we, we, we have, we, sl- we get the drugs or we get the names of the drugs and then we've got to do some research on them and, you know, try to learn as much as we can about the drugs and what they're for, the diseases they're for, and try to retain that. It's it's you know on top of everything else, and uh, it's it's difficult. So hopefully, you know what we're doing here is we're making it a little easier digesting some of this uh, for our uh, our colleagues out in practice who are watching. Um, you know, there we have what four new drugs, five new drugs today. Yes. Four. Yeah, four. and uh, they're all for different disorders. Some are more common than others. Uh, a couple of them. Uh, have a direct relationship to dental practice, and so we'll emphasize those. And uh, think, why don't we? Why don't we get going? All right, let's talk about Epsole. Okay. Epsole is benzoyl peroxide, and it, it's coming in a cream, and um, it, it got approved last week, and it's for rosacea. Yeah. All right. Now, benzoyl peroxide's been around for a long time. Long uh, time. My son used on his face. I used it on my face when I was in college. Um, This one's a little different in that it is micro encapsulated in a a silicone little micro capsule and that allows it to be time released. And it's this one is indicated just for uh, rosacea, not for acne and rosacea affects about five million people in the United States and mostly people of Celtic heritage or northern uh, east or northern eastern European. So fair skinned people are more more commonly get ro- rosacea and they get uh, and it, they get redness of their face, redness of the nose, um, persistent or visible expanded blood vessels on their face. Right. It can be a little bit disfiguring in a sense. Um, they can leave, uh, you can develop acne and it can P- leave marks. scars. Pitted right. scars. Yes. And it gets, and it gets worse over time. It's not a disease that gets better as someone gets older, they don't grow out of it. It just gets worse as they get older. It comes yeah. on when they're in their thirties generally, and um, it just doesn't get better. There hasn't been a really good drug to treat it. And uh, this uh, Epsole has been shown that it is effective in about 70% of patients who use it to, awesome. to significantly improve the uh, signs of rosacea. And in about half, um, basically almost completely eliminated. So there's no, almost no visible sign uh, that the patient has rosacea. So that's, this is a, a really a breakthrough drug for people who have rosacea. And like I said, there are 5 million uh, people in the United States that have it. You know, like you said, it's a, 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 a blushing or a flushing of the face with visible blood vessels 
And it's just a persistent redness right there. Yeah. And yeah. like you said, the tendency is for some patients to mess with it. And then that's why they wind up with the scarring right there. Yeah. So he, he, here we go again. Like you said, uh, this is a, a new breakthrough for these patients. Yeah. Um, something I, they can try because it's treating the inflammatory aspect of the lesions yeah. on their face. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know a couple of people who have rosacea um, who I've known for a long time. And it's just really... Uh, it's, it's right there. Uh, it's not anything they can hide. Uh, and so it's very debilitating for a lot of people. It affects, you know, can affect, um, their social life. It can affect their ability to get jobs sometimes. Yeah. Um, because they, they, you know, <laughs> come across as, as, you know, uh, even, even though there's not supposed to be any discrimination. Um, I think, I think it, it does in some sense, uh, make it more difficult because you might think, oh, well, their person is an alcoholic and that's why they've got the red face. Um, and so it might, it might bias people uh, unfairly and uh, incorrectly that uh, that's what's going on. And that's the reason for, uh, for the rosacea. Now you do see rosacea in, in chronic alcoholics, uh, but the primary rosacea is uh, not related to alcohol at all. Yeah. Well, let, let's hope that person that interviews for that job is, is, is chosen for their, yeah, their ability, character yeah. and their ability yeah. and the qualities they possess. Yeah. And um, ho hopefully their employer can see through that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So Jay, I guess what our next drug is all about. I mean, I'm sure you, you're so yeah. used to it because we have one almost every show. Yep. And uh, uh, this is Almus, which is a monoclonal antibody. It's yes. Devacizumab dash M A L Y. So that tells us two things. One, it's a uh, um, monoclonal antibody drug of yes. human origin. And the M A L Y suffix tells us that this is a biosimilar drug. So it's very similar to a drug called Avastin, yes. uh, which is also uh, Bevacizumab. Um, but this is, uh, this is for treating multiple different types of cancer, um, including metastatic colon cancer, uh, small cell cancer of the lung, glioblastoma, metastatic renal cell carcinoma, cervical cancer, epithelial uh, ovarian fallopian tube or primary peritoneal cancer. So it really, really treats uh, or helps treat uh, a lot of different cancers. Uh, now, it can't be used alone. It's not used by itself. It's used in combination with another chemotherapeutic drug. That's but right. this, again, has been shown to uh, really increase the, uh, the reduce the, the bulk of the tumor as well as increase survival. So, Jay, what, what, what's so unique? Also, it's not organ specific. OK, right. So uh, it can treat GI cancers. It can treat pulmonary cancers. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it, it's, it's a vascular, cancers. it's a vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor. That's right. So, so it affects all kinds of different tissues. So again, another breakthrough for us in the in the treatment of cancers. Okay, yeah. and I mean, I, I I just think it's great. You know, yeah. um, uh, the 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 more the merrier. They, they're they're pouring these things out, and uh, but like like we've done in the shows in our last thirteen episodes when we first started talking about the uh, the MABs monoclonal antibodies and of course this is a umab as you said it, it comes from a human source mm -hmm. as well so um and then we got the imab also as well uh, there's just going to be more and more and it's, it's an exciting field to see yeah so again we got to stress when, when you see that mab on that generic written drug on your health history that patient is on yeah. an immunosuppressant. Yeah, and you got to be aware because this drug in particular um, can really affect wound healing. And in fact, it's it's recommended that the patient be off this drug for at least 21 day or 28 days before any kind of surgical treatment that includes periodontal surgery, oral surgery, um, because of the high likelihood of complications, delayed uh, wound healing and uh, wound infections. And it can also cause uh, post-op hemorrhage. So this, this drug, as great as it is, um, does have some side effects that are directly uh, applicable to dental practice. Because we're going to, you know, if you're doing anything surgical on a patient who is on this drug, then you got to be careful. You got to cover, cover them with antibiotics and make sure your surgery is, is as atraumatic as possible. 
and really watch them in the post-operative period to make sure their wound is healing normally and uh, they don't have any signs of, of infection or, or wound breakdown and be aware that they may bleed uh, more than um, more than if they weren't on the drug. Great point, because you're, you're talking about surgical complications that we all want to try to minimize. Yeah. But if you do surgery, you're going to have to know how to deal with the complications. Yeah. yeah. Period. Yeah. All right. This drug has a number of complications, including uh, GI fistula formation, uh, talked about wound healing and hemorrhage. It can cause uh, thromboembolic uh, uh, events. It can cause hypertension. Um, it can cause renal injury and proteinuria. Uh, it can cause infusion-related infusion reactions. And it's one of the drugs that can also uh, uh, lead to what we're going to talk about in a little bit is congestive heart failure. Yes. Yeah, we, we touched base last week. And we'll finish it this week. Yeah. So, no. again... Uh, MAB, monoclonal antibodies, yeah. all right? You have an yep. uh, immunosuppressed patient right, right. there. Red flag. Red, Red flag for dental that's practice. right. That's right. Yep. And that's something we'll just keep on saying on the show, Jay. Yeah. Just, that's a red flag, period. Yeah. Yep. And um, just keep that in mind. Yep. Okay, let's move to our next one. And, okay. Um, it looks like this, it's going to be Vijoice. Yeah. Right? Uh, Alpelisib yes. tablets. And this is a another one of those kinase inhibitors, kinase and inhibitor. it uh, it works on actually it's it's for treatment of are you ready for this PIK three CA related overgrowth spectrum, or PROS P R O S. So this is this this um, this gene um, uh, mutation um, in the P one ten alpha protein um, in this gene. In the, in the PIK3CA gene uh, can cause a lot of effects. What this drug is, is it, it or the, the phospho, phosphatidyl uh, denoxital um, is what is, uh, is a subunit of this <laughs> long name, uh, is a subunit of, a of, <laughs> subunit of this uh, compound. And it phosphorylates a uh, number of signaling proteins, uh, signaling molecules. And that are involved with cell proliferation, migration of cells, maturation of fat cells. And so you can imagine when this gene is mutated, these um, cellular processes are out of control. And so you have this, this overgrowth spectrum. It's not just one disease or, or one manifestation or a couple. There are multiple. And one of them is called the Clove syndrome. And that's associated with uh, uh, lipomatous growths um, in typically involving the trunk, uh, vascular malformations, um, epidermal nevi or moles, basically differences in uh, uh, can affect the bone and the skeletal system and right. can cause abnormalities uh, because you've got asymmetric growth on one side. You've got basically this abnormal growth on one side. It can cause scoliosis. Um, it's also um, associated with large fingers and toes macrodactyly. And um, so it, it's a very, again, very debilitating uh, group of, of findings. And the next one is uh, megalencephaly capillary malformation syndrome, MCAP syndrome, which is also part of this PROS group. Interesting. And, All right. and so you can tell by the name megalencephaly that it causes enlargement of the brain. It can be uh, unilateral or bilateral. If it's unilateral and it's hemi, um, hemi megalencephaly, <laughs> uh, and but but because of the uh, hypertrophy of the brain, these abnormal growths in the brain, you get seizures, um, you get uh, uh, you know weak muscle weakness, um, you get uh, um, uh, intellectual disability because it's all affecting uh, the normal function of the brain. It right. can also cause um, as far as the, the digits go, polydactyly, where you've got more fingers and toes than you need, or syndactyly, where they're fused together, as well as um, heart anomalies. So this, again, is a very, um, very uh, debilitating syndrome that's part of this uh, um, uh, pros, and, pros spectrum. Another one is called hyper, hemihyperplasia multiple lipomatomatous syndrome, HHML, associated with asymmetrical moderate overgrowth affecting the limbs, um, mostly slowly growing lipomatous masses, but they're distributed all through the body and there can be 
um, venous malformations also associated with it. Now, the next uh, disorder in that category is one that is directly related to dentistry. It's called facial infiltrating lipomatosis. And this causes overgrowth and enlargement of one side of the face. So if you see a patient who has uh, facial asymmetry and also mucosal neuromas, uh, which is another characteristic of, of this syndrome, um, that should make you think of facial infiltrating lipomatosis. Uh, they can also have macro uh, hemimacroglossia, which means half of their tongue is enlarged, and they can have uh, bone enlargement on one side versus the other, as well as premature dental eruption. So this one, the facial in infiltrating uh, lipopo lipomatosis, um, is definitely something that we may see or recognize in our dental practices. And so, as you can see, the um, the signs and symptoms of this PROS uh, syndrome uh, really depend on exactly what the uh, specific disorder is. And um, so this is this is really a significant uh, some, uh, mutation. It's a somatic mutation, so it's not inherited, but it can lead to all kinds of uh, abnormalities. And so- now, uh, But Jay, I, I couldn't find anything else that was used to treat this except for yeah. by Joyce now. Yeah, this is what they call an orphan, basically an orphan syndrome. Yes. Um, there aren't that many people who have it. It's extremely rare. And so in the past, drug companies were not all that enthusiastic about spending you know millions and millions of dollars sure. to treat patients with um, very rare dis uh, diseases. Now things have changed. And so there is a lot of research going into treating these, these orphan diseases. That's awesome. And so Vyjoyce is, is a breakthrough drug for these patients who have these rare syndromes. An another breakthrough drug right there. Okay. Yeah. So what's next? Igalmi. Okay. I G A L M I it's dexmetadomatomidine. Uh, Okay. Next metatomidine, excuse me. And uh, it's, but it's in a sublingual film. Okay. okay. I, think I, had, I think I had breath mints, the Listerman <laughs> little things <laughs> that you melt on your tongue. So it's basically the same idea. So next metatomidine. Okay. Yeah. And so it is a for, used for the treatment of agitation and it comes in a sublingual film. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a, a, a prude alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonist. Mm -hmm. And it's indicated for the acute, acute treatment of agitation associated with schizophrenia or bipolar 1 or 2 disorder in yeah. adults. Yeah, and that, that affects about 7.3 million people in the U.S. That, 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 uh, that's that a have, lot of people that have this, okay? That, that have either schizophrenia or bipolar disorders. Yes. And a quarter of these people will have this agitation as part of it, and they may have a dozen or more episodes in a year's period. And so you can imagine what a stress this is, not only on the mental health care system when they are agitated, um, trying to find a good drug to calm them down, but it, it puts a lot of stress on, on their families, on their caretakers and on the patients themselves. And, you know, Jay, with, uh, dexmedetomidine, you know, in our field and, and, and anesthesia, they're using that now. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see, do we ever turn, use some type of sublingual film pre-op wise? Yeah. Yeah. To help uh, start sedating patients before we it, take them into surgery. Right. Because you know how, how anxious patients can be. So yeah. this may wind up being an off label use for this drug as well. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this drug is, is, uh, is a kind of a breakthrough drug and that there's not been nothing even similar to it that's come out in the last 10 years. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, do you know many people using this J IV wise for no. oral surgery? No, no, I don't. I, I don't, I don't either. Yeah. I mean, I, but I do know they talk about it as well too. And so, um, it's going to be interesting to see how this does eventually phase itself into our field. Yep. All right. Well, that's, those are all the new drugs that, uh, yes. have come out in the last two weeks. Um, so now let's, uh, finish talking about heart failure. So it, when we get back to heart failure, we, we, we touched on the fact that there are four different stages of heart failure, stage A, stage B, stage C, stage D. And there's also associated treatment with each of those as well, too. Basically, yeah. it's a stacking 
order, Jay. And so yeah. um, if you're going to have heart failure, you, you won't stay J because yeah. as you go down in the alphabet, you get worse with right. your heart failure. And yeah. that's so, so that's something I want our viewers to listen and yeah. understand the, the, when you get to, if you have a stage D heart failure patient in your office, you have a yeah. significant you have medically compromised. Yes, yeah. you do. Yeah. Now okay. stage A, these patients are asymptomatic. Right. Um, but they have a, and they have normal ejection fraction. So the amount of blood that's squeezed out of their heart compared to the filling volume uh, and normal is about 53 to 70%. Correct. Uh, so they have normal ejection fraction, but they do have either a family history of heart failure or they have some of the risk factors such as uh, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, um, history of alcohol abuse, um, family history of cardiomyopathy. <laughs> I think that. <laughs> I got some dogs excited. Yeah, my dog, my dogs are being nice right now. They're, they were going crazy a little while ago. Um, and also some chemotherapeutic drugs. Um, right. And we talked about Almacis is yes. one drug that can lead to congestive heart failure. So stage A um, is basically that's not going to affect your treatment in any significant way because these are asymptomatic patients with a normal ejection fraction. Right. So – Again, about 55 to 70 is a normal ejection fracture. 40 to 54, slightly below normal. Yeah. Uh, 35, 39, moderately below normal. And then less than 35 is severely below normal. Yeah. So uh, um, just like we should be asking our patients that come in that are diabetics, what's your A1C? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. They know that. Uh, if right. somebody comes in with heart failure, what's your ejection fracture? Yeah. And again, well, the, the, the higher only, the yeah. number, the better. Okay. Yeah. So with well, stage B, yes. um, they're also asymptomatic, but they've had an echocardiogram, which shows that their ejection fraction is 40% or less. Yes. And so that's, that was, that's what puts them into, uh, into stage B congestive heart failure. So, so st stage B, Jay, will also be, um, uh, what's called heart failure with reduced EF right. and, um, but asymptomatic. But asymptomatic, yeah. And th then we go into C after that, and, and they have the, a they yeah, have those a are diagnosis the of heart. Folks. That's right. That's yeah. right. Shortness yeah. of breath, feeling tired, weak legs, yeah. um, waking Edema. up constantly to urinate. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, uh, uh, unable to exercise. Right. So, um, th this is the sicker patient coming yeah. into your office right yeah. there. Yeah, they and, have they have uh, lower extremity edema. Um, and they may have some uh, respiratory problems, shortness of breath because of, um, you know, because of heart failure and not being able to oxygenate, oxygenate and move the blood uh, throughout their body as well as they need to. And then, of course, the final stage of heart failure is stage D. These people right. do not get better no. with treatment. OK, and so as you can imagine, they are going to have a plethora of yeah. medical conditions in your office. Okay. This yeah. is the bright red flag, Jay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So the, these a, patients will be on multiple medications for their heart failure, um, but they will also have other comorbidities like maybe history of a heart attack, um, hypertension, um, diabetes, high blood pressure, arrhythmias, kidney disease. Yes. Um, if they smoke or use recreational drugs, um, and some medications, like I said, chemotherapeutic agents can also uh, contribute to congestive heart failure and make it worse. So, the, so these are these are patients that have an even lower ejection fraction. They're really these are really sick. This is kind of the final stage of heart failure. And, and, and you know, to our listeners out there, there there may be many people out there that have taken an IV sedation course. I, I like to caution you when you have these patients in your office. I mean, yes, they're going might be anxious, and you know, like. Okay, I'll 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 do a yeah. light IV sedation. Yeah, these are fragile be, patients. Be, be cognizant about the amount of fluid you give them. Yeah, yeah. All right, because yeah, you can fluid overload them, and now they're easily. on their way. Yes, they're on their way to the ER. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just just be careful about these patients right here. Yeah. A very very good uh, cardiology consultation with the before you do any form of treatment on these patients. Right, right exactly. Now. Find out what they can tolerate, what drugs they can have, how deeply you can sedate them. 
um, and what their procedure tolerance is. How long can they sit in your chair? Because again, they're going to have uh, in with congestive heart, heart failure, we talked about it before, they're going to have orthopnea, difficulty breathing yes. when they're laying flat or, um, or even sitting up a little bit. And uh, I've mentioned it before, but we measure orthopnea uh, by asking the patient how many pillows how many they pillows? sleep on at night. Yeah. One pillow orthopnea, two pillow, three pillow. I think I had a patient when I was in med school who had four pillow orthopnea. She almost had to sleep upright um, to be able to uh, get through the night. Amazing. Yeah. All right. So the last thing we're going to cover are the new guidelines for uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis. So they've, they've changed seems, a little bit. Yeah, it, it seems like we always float back and forth on this, Jay. And um, yeah, who who do we pre med and who do we not? Yeah, well, so so we, we've got four groups, Jay, and um, a, a group one would be that person with a prosthetic cardiac valve. Yeah, uh, the prosthetic material used for valve repair, mm -hmm. and then an implantable cardiac device such as a transcatheter aortic valve. Yeah. Yeah. Or okay. if they've had a history of endocarditis, that puts them in a group two. That, that's correct. And um, then congenital heart disease would be uh, along with unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease, yeah. like a, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. a shunt or conduit. Or a fistula. Yeah. That, or a uh, fistula. That hasn't been. So a basically a structural, um, a uh, basically a structural abnormality in the heart. So that would be group three. Yeah. And then J group four. Those are cardiac transplant recipients uh, who uh, their valve has regurgitation. So they have that turbulent flow again. So it's the turbulent flow that sets the patient up for the possibility of uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis. And most of these, um, uh, when it occurs, it's the strep viridans uh, uh, group of, of bacteria, which are very plentiful in the oral cavity. And they like to refer to that as VGS IE. Yeah. And remember now, again, IE is an, another one of those acronyms. If it's on your chart somewhere, ask. Just, yeah. just, just, it, you know, if the assistant sees before and says IE, you want to know that's infective endocarditis. Right. And as Jay has alluded to, that's a group two patient that you must cover with antibiotics. Right. Yep. Absolutely. So not, not the, the patient with an innocent murmur. No. Or, or a very minor regurgitation or a very minor leak, but really the, the patients who are most at risk for developing endocarditis, these are the ones that we now pre-med. And the pre-medication hasn't really changed all that much. Um, it's still the, the standard is two grams of amoxicillin 30 to 60 minutes before your procedure, and that's it, no follow-up doses. I remember, I think when I was in dental school, I think we started pre-medding the day before or two days before, and they were on antibiotics for like five days after. Yes. Um, it was, uh, and then it, and then the dosages got uh, less and less and shorter and shorter uh, over time to now we just have the, the one time regimen that yeah. is uh, shown to be effective. Yeah. And, and, and you know, um, and, and that's the go-to. And of course in kids, it's 50 milligrams per kilogram. And then if, uh, and if they're unable to take oral medication, our still go-to drugs, ampicillin, cefazolin, and ceftriaxone. Yeah. Okay. And those are all either IV or IM. That's correct. Yeah. So those have to be given uh, from a, either uh, some type of parentally, either into the muscle or through a, through a vein. Now, if they can take oral, but they're allergic to penicillin or ampicillin, then we have a few options. One is cephalexin, otherwise yep. known as Keflex, and the dose for that is two grams, just like the amoxicillin. Um, azithromycin, Zithromax, or clarithromycin, uh, we give the dose for that is 500 milligrams. Yep. Or even, and doxycycline, a drug that you don't see all that often. Um, you can use that for pre med also if they're, if they had, let's say they had an anaphylactic reaction to a penicillin, you may give them a cephalosporin with some caution. Um, and maybe not want to give it. And if they've had a, uh, uh, a erythromycin based drug and they've had problems with that, then that leaves us with doxycycline. And, you know, Jay, that's the, uh, the, the new guy on the block. Now the new yeah. kid on the block, because they took clindamycin off. Yeah. Um, just having too many problems with, um, uh, 
PMC or pseudomembranous colitis yeah. or, or, or colitis, basically. Yeah. Um, the risks far outweighed the benefits putting patients on clindamycin. So yeah. uh, they added doxycycline. I like doxycycline being added to this because it's such an easy one capsule for our patients to take 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure. Yeah. yeah. All right. And that's it. I mean, I, 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 I get it about the amoxicillin, um, but you got four pills to swallow. Yeah. Some people yeah. have a hard time. All right. They do. They this do. Doxycycline is so it's one capsule. Yeah. Yeah. And, now you uh, can get amoxicillin in a suspension yeah. and have them take it that way. But uh, one one pill is definitely easier. Now, if they can't take oral medication and they're allergic to penicillin, yep. then we're back to the cephalosporins, either cefazolin or ceftriaxone. And those are given IM or IV one gram, again, uh, 30 to 60 minutes before our procedure. That's right. And, for, and you for, could also break up one of the capsules if they couldn't swallow really good, like say the doxycycline and uh, and just a little, little bit of a sip of water, mix it up, have them swallow it. Yeah. You, yep. You'll be fine. All right. You don't yep. have to worry about it. So, yeah. Nope. Well, I guess uh, that's about it. That kind of wraps us up. Um, and uh, it, our, isn't it just fun just talking about this? Yeah. How, how fast time goes by we, so quickly. Yeah. And, and, you know, hopefully, Jay, we're all going to be lecturing here together very soon because we've got some exciting news hopefully coming out very soon. And yeah. Um, yeah, I, I look forward to working with you and lecturing you in person. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, it'll be fun. And, it'll be fun. Oh, it's going to be great, man. We're going to have some yeah. awesome topics. Yeah. In the meantime, though, our next episode, number 14, yes. is going to be on May 12th in two weeks at uh, five o'clock Pacific time, uh, eight o'clock on the East Coast. And if you're in the middle, it's uh, somewhere in the middle. That's right. Thank <laughs> y'all so much for uh, tuning in tonight. Have a great night. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Good night, Thank everybody. Bye-bye.